I believe that Dr. Judy Wood is perhaps the most significant voice on this, the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Her book, Where Did the Towers Go?, is mind-boggling in its implications. The hundreds of images throughout the book are surreal, even shocking. Yet in the face of the evidence that the WTC buildings were not brought down by either airplanes or a controlled demolition, Dr. Wood makes no attempt to point fingers at who or why the buildings came down. In fact, this interview reveals that it is a respect for the technology that likely did the catastrophic damage that propelled her to write this book, a book that has colossal implications. Let's go to Dr. Wood. Uh, Judy, thanks so much for being here. This is uh, this book, Where Did the Towers Go?, is, seems to me to be the single most comprehensive look at what happened on the day of 9-11. And there, that's kind of loaded, and we'll get into that in a little bit. I mean, in there are so many surprises. I thought I had read a lot about this event, but page after page, I was shocked by the information you were presenting. And a very timely, just a little timely thing before we get in here was um, with having a week of news on Hurricane Irene, which was what a Category One uh, that was by two miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, two miles an hour, dropping down to a tropical storm. A week's worth of hysterical coverage in the media. However, one of the little-known things I just I'm just going to toss out there right off the top was there was a hurricane, massive hurricane, much greater. It, what was it? A Category Three, I believe, sitting right off the coast of New York City on the day of 9/11. And I haven't talked to one person that even knew that was there. And in fact, you've been getting a lot of reports on that, as I understand. Yes. Uh, there's a, a fellow who emailed me. He, as synchronicity would have it, uh, he was reading my book and it just got into chapter 18. This is a, a college professor in Vermont who had heard all of these horrendous news reports about Hurricane Irene coming. <laughs> so he starts, he turns to the start of of chapter 18 and this big hurricane Aaron picture and huh <laughs> and he finished the book and then ordered five more <laughs> <laughs> yes I mean I was shocked when I saw that but you know what I was even shocked more by was the what appeared to be cleansed um weather forecasts that were going on just prior um, to the buildings going down. And here this massive hurricane sitting right off the coast, headed right into New York City. And they're saying, well, it's a lovely day here. And they even had a little, as you show in the book, little red arrows pointing where there will be a thunderstorm a little later on in the day or a, t a tornado kicking up. And yet they're ignoring this huge thing that should have been dead center of their coverage. And I, what shocked me, and I know you're not a conspiracy theorist, and I'm not asking you to go there. How in the world, why in the world, would that not be right up front and center of the, the coverage that day, not just of the weather, but dominating all of the news? And that's just one of so many anomalous events and, and stories that lead to that kind of question. Let's just, let's just launch into it. Um, it, it. We can start really going in the order of your book because it's so well laid out. Your evidence is really, it's pointing to something different than the 9-11 truth movement and the architects and various people that have stated that this was a thermite-based explosion, the building had been wired in advance and so forth. And what you're saying in this is essentially, it will, is very different than that. Let's talk about why. Let's, let's, where would you like to start with it? I mean, we can get right into pancakes or whatever you like. Well, I, I like to look at evidence because 9-11 was, was a psychological operation. It was a physical destruction and psychological destruction. Yes. They were both. And it, the psychological destruction planted seeds out there to divert people. In, you know, when, If they were not accepting the, the official story that went out on the media, there was a backup story being planted. And it, it gets people caught up into arguing about opinions and theories and speculations. Let's just look at the evidence because evidence is unifying. It is. And you're, what you've done, been very, very careful to do um, here in the book and also in the media is you are not go, venturing to say who may have perpetrated this event why they perpetrated it, or even how they perpetrated it, although you do put some very strong evidence down here as to what, what happened, you want to stick with the facts only and allow other people to begin putting their own dots together. Is, is that my understanding? 
Well, also, you need to begin with the evidence to show what the crime was you want to charge somebody for. If you're going to say they did it, what is it? Right. Right. What that, is it? Uh-huh. And that recent uh, uh, Casey Anthony trial that was hyped in the media, they, they were determining all sorts of things. But the next day, a jury member said it so wonderfully. She said, well, if I don't know how the child died, how can I you know, put something on death row for it. Yes. Yes. You, know, you have to know what the crime is before you charge somebody with it. And that's the first step in any investigation. So start with the evidence. Well, let's first just give me a, a little list of your credentials because you're a, a serious engineer on in, uh, many modalities of engineering. Can you just tell us a little bit so we understand who you are? Well, I have a, a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering a uh, master's degree in engineering mechanics, which is like applied physics, and a PhD in materials engineering science with expertise in image analysis, optical methods, applied mechanics, and over 35 years of experience in this area. Yeah, that's. I just wanted to get that up front so people understand this is not a theory. You're, you're, a, you're a scientist through and through, and this book is absolutely amazing in what you've compiled. When it, I have to tell you, when it came to the mathematical formulas, I kind of went to the next page and just got the gist <laughs> of it. <laughs> I, that's the only part I didn't hang with you on, but I understood the concept of what you were saying. Okay, so um, out of the shoot, everyone knows what the official story is, and I think anyone listening to this has already dismissed that long ago, but what they probably have not not dismissed is that this was a um, most like most people at this point I thinking that uh, this was a controlled demolition and it w there were explosives used and many people have read or been exposed to the notion that thermite may have been involved and let's start into uh, a bit of the science I know we have a lot to do in an hour here but let's start well, into that a, a quick summary is that the buildings didn't burn up nor did they slam to the ground but they turned into dust in midair. Mm -hmm. how, how do I know that? Because if they had collapsed to the ground, you'd have a pile of debris that would correspond to 210 story buildings. That didn't happen. Lower Manhattan would have been flooded due to a broken bathtub, the dike that holds out the Hudson River. Few people realize that the towers were built in the Hudson River. And you know, the bedrock is 70 feet below the water table. So there's this dike they call the bathtub or slurry wall that holds out the Hudson River. If you crash down two 500,000 ton buildings onto the bathtub, it would have ruptured and flooded the subway tunnels, the path train tunnels. That didn't happen. As a matter of fact, when they uh, took down the remains of Building 6, they used a cable to pull it down because they were afraid to use explosives. And this was a six-story building. Mm -hmm. It was just this little clump left. And the other way I know that it wasn't uh, that buildings turned to dust, just the simple way, is that if it if uh, the buildings had collapsed to the ground, they'd make a thud, and the seismic signal that was that was recorded did not correspond to the size of the buildings. Uh, the seismic signal corresponded to a 16-story building or a 20-story building, not 110-story buildings. Yes. And and when you're talking about this, you call it dustification, you're looking at, I mean, just just the real basics. You would expect at least for there to at least be, as you say, that pancake effect if there had actually been uh, even a controlled demolition of the building. There was no pancake. There were no pancakes. Right. You'd have a kabumpity-bumpity-bumpity-bump, -bump -bump and you should have a stack of stuff left over. Not only that, if you're driving this jackhammer kabumpity-bumpity-bump -bump into onto bedrock, the ground should be shaking. <laughs> yes, absolutely. The ground actually, with that little uh, signal, only shook for eight seconds. It would take nine and a half seconds in a vacuum to drop a bowling ball off the roof and have it hit the pavement. Yeah, at the same time, the building itself came down in how many seconds? I don't. I don't say it came down. Well, it, it, it turned into dust. Yeah. So if you, if you uh, dustify, if you have a new phenomenon, you, you need a new word to describe it. Yes. It's unscientific to uh, use the description of a known uh, phenomenon to describe an unknown phenomenon. So I say dustification. Mm -hmm. it's, we've never seen a building do this before, so it is a new thing. So if the building dustifies from 
you know, the 20th story on up, and you're only dropping the lower, you know, 20 stories, which is about the size of the rubble you see, which is about the size of the seismic signal you see, and so forth. And hmm. surrounding buildings didn't have any stab wounds, I call them, you know, a, a beam going, you know, stabbing into a building. Mm -hmm. Didn't have that above, like, the 20th floor. Mm -hmm. And this is not to be confused even with pulverization, right? Right, right. Let's talk about it. Pulverization is like grinding something up. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a hammer and, and hit a rock on a against another rock. Uh, you, you get you know big chunks, little chunks, in between size chunks. You, you get a, a random size. You don't get um, nano size particles. Yes. So that because a lot of people say, well, it was pulverized. No, it wasn't pulverized. You're being very specific when you say this building was dustified or converted to dust rapidly. Exactly, exactly, because it's a different process than what we've seen before. And it's not vaporization. Vaporization implies heat. Yes. And the building wasn't cooked. And at the same time, you have recordings of people who were standing on the window sills and who were calling in um, on 911 and saying they were so hot they uh, they had started taking clothing off even what was what was going on there let's take us through to that point of what you, you had what you see in the building well when i was used to swim a lot in the mornings when i was at virginia tech and the fraternity party had uh, joked around the night before and cranked up the thermostat and when we got there, it was like 93 degrees. Uh -huh. <laughs> they said we could swim at our own risk. And I started swimming. Oh, this is great because I hate getting in cold water. I got halfway out in the middle of the pool, and I realized I was in trouble. I was overheating. Mm -hmm. So I rolled over on my back just to kind of quit making more heat. And somebody threw me a rope. And I remember wondering, is it that important to reach over there and get that rope? Oh, your mind wasn't working. You know, maybe I will, maybe I won't. And I remember also there's a time limit how long you can stay in the sauna and in the hot tub. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you're really hot, you just, you know, function. Right. And and these recordings that we heard, like of the Melissa Joy, it's, I'm really hot, I'm really hot, I'm really burning up, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And you never heard her choking the entire time. At first I thought it was a, a fake call, but then I realized, no, this is, th th there's something else going on here. For somebody to, the, the conversation they aired for us is like five minutes. And someone could not survive in that kind of heat that she was describing for five minutes. So apparently she was sensing heat. Yes, let's talk about that um, and so what happened with another thing I was, besides the fact that these, these buildings turn to dust. So uh, we can go into all the science, but really I would encourage people um, to get a copy of the book. It, it explains all the science right through from the, the very beginning. When the bu buildings were standing, you take people through this very nicely. We don't have to get into all of the science and equations here on that. Just Let's just say these buildings turn to dust. Yeah, but I think you were kind of alluding to the, the, what the heat. To as the jumpers. Yes, the jumpers and the heat, and the heat that they, you said this d building did not burn, yet they keep, kept saying, I'm so hot. Right, and then we have uh, these, these uh, people hanging from the outside mm -hmm. of the 105th floor. That's, you know, five floors from the, stop, uh, from the top, uh, taking off their clothes, or with their clothes already off. Clothes protect you from high heat. They protect you from fire. And, and also, if you did take your clothes off, why hang from the 105th floor by hand and a foot to take your clothes off? Uh, yeah, so what, do you, what, were they, what was going on there? Why were they so hot if you're saying there was no fire, there wasn't about fire? Well, I wasn't there, so I don't know, but I can say it's consistent with something like an energy field. You think of a, you know, microwaves used to control crowds. Mm -hmm. They make the crowds run. And make the crowds want to just, you know, get away from it. Where it's because it's just very painful. Mm -hmm. And so, what, like what Melissa Doy was describing was intense pain. Yes. N not thermal heat, but the, the sensation to her nerve endings. Are you saying then, because again, going back to the building without going into all the science of it right here, these buildings pulverized. I didn't pulverize, they it dustified. Doesn't... They yes. dustified. These people are saying, I'm so hot. They're standing out on a ledge. And what really struck me about the people portion of this, I really, I couldn't get it off my mind, is that, and it struck me about this 
at the time. First of all, I was under the impression for some reason that, you know, maybe a few dozen people had jumped. Yet you're saying a massive number of people jumped, fell, or were propelled from these ledges. And they were, it was the, 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 um, emergency help on the ground was saying it was raining people. People were falling out of the air at the rate of one every 30 or 40 seconds. But that's not human nature to jump. Exactly. And those poor firefighters who they're trained to save lives and they, they felt so helpless. I think there was even one that they had to watch because he wanted to go out and catch people. Yeah. You just, it, it's, you feeling helpless has got to be the worst human experience. Well, and just the oddness of that many people supposedly jumping. Well, first of all, are you saying they were jumping or you, because you said you have some pictures in there where they didn't all look like they were jumping. Some of them looked as though they were caught off guard. Right. I, I, I'm just putting the data out there. It's cumulative data and it just keeps you wondering what is going on here. You know, we don't have to come to a conclusion with the, each chapter, but we mm -hmm. can sum things up and say, Hmm, this, this is not normal. A fire doesn't cause people to behave this way. Bombs in the building don't cause people to behave this way. Yes. At what they were doing, the way they were behaving, or perhaps the way they were feeling inside their own skin was not anything that is we would recognize as normal. Something abnormal was happening. And taking it from there, the the emergency workers, firemen, and so forth were saying, when the people landed on the ground, and this is very bothersome, I mean, this is just really not a pleasant thought or scene in our minds, but the people didn't just fall and crumble, crunch, like what normally would happen at a free fall speed. They were exploding. There were body parts everywhere. Yes, and that is a very kind of delicate thing. I'm, I myself um, endured a uh, near-fatal injury from being hit by a, a vehicle traveling in excess of 80 miles per hour. Mm. So I, th my first, this is the first time I think I've said this, uh, but, you know, I had a real connection with those jumpers because of that. It was, you know, that, their uh, free fall speed, their terminal velocity, can't be much more than that when, in street clothes. And you would know that when you hit a deer with a vehicle, it, it, it's busted up. And, you know, probably won't live. There's very little chance of survival, but there is a chance. And it's busted up. You don't have a fingernail over here, you know, a tooth over there, uh, you know, a rib over here. It doesn't take things apart like that. Impacts. No, no, it doesn't. And we, we were talking, about, I was talking to Scott about this, and the... It, what we both came to, of course, is it sounded more like a human or when you hear these horrid stories of little children experimenting and putting a little animal inside a microwave or something awful mm -hmm. like that. This sounded really much more along that line than anything that would be a normal fall and the, the injuries or death from a normal fall. Right, right. It, there was definitely something different going on there. Yeah, it was almost as though they were being microwaved and splattering and blowing, literally, their bodies, pieces <laughs> blowing apart. And how many people are we talking about that actually fell, jumped, or were propelled out of the building? Uh, about 1,200, estimated from the firemen's testimonies, uh, about 1,200 out of the North Tower. Yeah. And then you add to that the 343 firefighters, uh, you get, uh, you know, 1,543. And that's about as much DNA samples, different, different people approximately, that were identified. So that raises another question. And that question is? It, those on the first or second or third floor, firefighters, or those uh, who jumped from the building or left the building out the windows seem to be the only samples of DNA that remained. And I guess you're not going to speculate as to what happened to the rest. Well, it makes you wonder about dustification. Yes, 
It does, and you know, as people are listening to this right now, you know, we've listened to enough other interviews,、um, especially from those who believe that this was the result of a demolition, a controlled demolition. And one of the things that came, comes up repeatedly is, well, if this wasn't a controlled demolition, then why were all of these、uh, firefighters reporting hearing a series of explosions, especially down in the lower levels? Well, if if you're dustifying a building, that means the material is like coming apart. It's losing its strength and integrity.、Uh, the towers had water tanks every so many floors. You can't pump water all the way directly to the top anyway, so they pump it to different holding tanks every so many floors. Now, imagine what will happen when those water tanks start to dissolve and lose、mm-hmm. their integrity. Gonna, they're going to rupture,、mm-hmm. or an air pressure tank. When it gets the wall thickness gets so thin or loses a certain amount of strength, it's going to explode.、Mm-hmm. And actually, there were、uh, firefighters at ground level, quite a few of them, who、um, uh, witnessed Scott tanks exploding. What is a Scott tank? They're the air tanks that the firefighters wear, so they can breathe good air while they're in the smoky environment. Oh, and they, and they were exploding as well. Sitting on the fire trucks, they're exploding. Yeah. The, well, that's again. We're talking about people who almost appear to have exploded a building that has turned to dust. Twelve hundred people were driven to、uh, either fall or jump to their death. Which I just, I still have a hard time getting my mind around that one. It's just, it's appalling.、Um, I had had no idea it was that number of people. And now you're talking about these exploding Scott tanks that were sitting in their trucks. Let's go a little. Let's take that a little bit further when we're talking about these、uh, explosions. There were cars and trucks,、uh, including fire trucks, that were toasted and literally taken into the air in some cases. How now? How talk about that, if you would, please. I I、uh, refer to them as toasted cars because they're, they're toast. Their history. Yeah, I, I don't know what. Yeah, I can't decide what happened to them. You know, instead of trying to force them into, you know, burned or or whatnot, I just say that they're toast. And、um, uh, there was. It seemed to be the cars. I started noticing this pattern. The, there was flip cars, but they didn't seem to be as toasted as the upright cars. And this one particular picture is a toasted car, and in front of it, there's an upside down car. It was parked like in the right place. It's just. Wheels in the air, right, right, and you wouldn't think it'd park that way. Well, no, you wouldn't think it would park that way. <laughs> and there's there's a particular quote、um, by、uh, Rene Davila that I liked. Is when being questioned, he's by a supervisor. He says, "Well, was was your vehicle destroyed?、Um, yeah, it was destroyed. Was it on fire? What was it on fire?" Fire! We saw the sucker blow up. We heard a boom. Yeah, and not only that, some of the cars that went boom were seven blocks away. Now this gets pretty controversial. I mean, everything here is controversial. But what do you mean controversial? Well, I mean, well,、um, it seems like this would be sort of a non sequitur scientifically. Why would cars blow up or be toast? Not blow up, but be incinerated seven blocks away during this event? And, and in between, without burning paper. Without burning paper, how how's that? What how's that possible? That's why I use toasted co- instead of burned, because that's weird. I, or I call it weird fires. I have to have a different term for it.、Uh, yeah, there was there was a、uh, firefighter who was over by FDR Drive and saw this this car go into spontaneous combustion, and thinking you know, like it's got to be a normal situation. He's trying to fit. What's happened into that? So, well, it must have been a fireball that rolled down the street and hit the car. Yeah, he didn't see the the fireball, but how else can you explain a car going into spontaneous combustion? Well, yeah, exactly. And and why seven blocks from the scene? That、uh, that makes no sense whatsoever. And yet, this all happened in、uh, roughly the same time frame. And at the same time, the people that were there as this was occurring, speaking of combustion, a lot of the the witnesses there were saying there was this odd sensation. They they weren't, as you say, there wasn't the kind of seismic activity that you would have expected. There wasn't the crunching and crump coming down of the building sound you would have expected. But a lot of them had the sense. 
that they had been swept into the center of a tornado or some kind of uh, weather event. And there was there was one um, EMT who thought maybe she must have died because how else was she floating down the stairs? But having God pick her up and carry her down the stairs. Yes, floating. Float- right, and and uh, there's it was this uh, one particular uh, eyewitness. I uh, was talking about, um, he says, I, I don't remember the sound of the building yes. hitting the ground. Yeah. Someone told me that it, that it was measured on the Richter scale. I don't, I, I don't know how true that is, but if the building was hitting the ground hard, how do I not remember the sound of it? Yeah, I think I have him written down. Michael Ober, I think was his name. Yep, he was exactly. an, yeah, an EMT. And again, this feeling, people were picked up. And they were tossed about, and they would land 30, 40 feet from where they had started, just picked up, and they landed somewhere else. Cars. There, There's a picture you have on one of the pages of a car that had simply been picked up, and it looked as though it had been placed on top of a, a little wooden fence. I mean, oh, it's a very that's, odd picture. Uh, that's that's Hurricane Wilma. Oh, that's Hurricane Wilma. So right. this, it, yeah. I was drawing the, the comparison with the same type of energy fields. Yeah. Yeah, that same thing where it's just picked up and set down, um, which, again, there's when you're looking at that, if you want to talk about that for just a second, why were you drawing the comparison between Hurricane Wilma and the energy uh, signature of what was happening there that day? What's going on? Well, we, we started out talking about hurricanes. And yes. um, when, when I got to looking at the dust and how the dust went up, and that was another comment that Michael Ober had made, is that, he he thought he was he was inside somewhere. Some said, "No, you're you're outside. It's just it's it's dark out. One hundred percent of the sunlight was blocked out by this dust that went up. It, you know, it, for for you know, I don't know, a half hour afterwards, it was up and blocking out the sunlight. And so I decided to look to see where it went when it went up. And I looked at some weather satellite pictures, thinking I could get a better look at this dust going up. And what what wait, what's this? <laughs> this hurricane. Yeah. That was the first time I saw the hurricane. And like, how weird that we weren't told about this. We, we I don't remember anything about a hurricane. Hmm. And and it was a Category Three. And it was headed right to New York City for four days straight in you know, a straight line. Well, hmm. I wonder what hurricanes can do. So I started looking into that. And they're like a giant Tesla coil, and they they produce a um, a static field around them. And that interferes with other types of signals. And, you know, people who uh, have arthritis or other people often talk about feeling the weather coming. Mm -hmm. They can feel that field effect ahead of the storm. The same with the reason why birds leave town or spiders pack up their webs. They sense the storm coming because they feel that field effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, also in hurricanes, you have cars sitting on fences. And... Hurricanes are a big uh, torsion field, and a smaller, you know, quicker acting one is like a tornado. So let's look at those, too. We, we remember seeing tornadoes uh, supposedly lifting up houses, putting them on <laughs> someplace, or um, putting a, a car on a telephone pole. But the car isn't damaged. It wasn't like it got tumbled around. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a lot of evidence, like this spring, that big uh, Joplin tornado, there's this video of these people locked in a cooler or, you know, went, ran to the cooler in the convenience store for, for uh, safety. And you, you hear, you know, everybody's screaming when the tornado is tearing the place up, but you didn't hear it whoosh through, so it didn't tear the walls off of the cooler. But after it was done with, everyone's saying, well, is that you under me? Oh, is, that, is that your leg on top of me? So obviously the people have been jostled around. And you also saw the camera flying around. Mm-hmm. So there wasn't a moving wind tunnel through that, that uh, cooler they're in. But they were levitated and tumbled around. Now this has to be the result of some kind of, some kind of what, interference with electromagnetic fields or charge? or I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but this is dealing with electromagnetism, isn't it? Right. It, it, so it turns out electricity, magnetism, and gravity all interact. Okay. So it's, it's possible to affect gravity uh, with magnetism. And as I think we all had the experience as youngsters, getting a, a nail and wrapping a wire coil around it and sticking it in a 9-volt battery, 
and it turns the magnet into uh, I mean, it turns the the electricity into a magnet. The mm-hmm. nail becomes a magnet. Also, we learned that if you move a conductor through a magnetic field, you get electricity, which is how Nikola Tesla, you know, he discovered alternating current and applied it to uh, harnessing the the energy from the from the um, Niagara Falls uh, power plant. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so we can turn electricity into, into magnetism. We can turn magnetism into electricity. But we can also turn, affect gravity with magnetism. So there, just from what we're talking about so far, there had to be some kind of electromagnetics in play. And you were talking about tornadoes and how the, they have this effect where they can pick things up without uh, harming them through this this gravitational effect and, and land them or set them down somewhere. But you don't have dustification with tornadoes. I mean, there's more than that at play here. Right, right. It's, you sometimes do, but, uh, or, or destruction. And that's just yes. randomly kind of oriented. And there are aspects of the WTC complex that reminded me of tornadoes. How so? Building 4, the main body of Building 4 disappeared, turned into dust, went away, and just left the north wing standing, or some of, most of the north wing standing, mm-hmm. as though it was cut off with an X-Acto knife. And one story below ground in that area, you see some people walking through the mall. It, and then uh, another story below that in the parking garage area, it looks totally unaffected. Mm-hmm. Yes, totally unaffected. As though it happened from the ground up. You know, a few little punch throughs the ground here and there. But it, it, where did the, the main body of Building 4 go? And it reminded me so much of an experience I had as a child going through Topeka, Kansas, right after that horrendous tornado that went through. You could look at through this... Um, into this apartment building that had been sliced in two. Mm-hmm. There was a made bed in there with magazines still on the on the bed, books on the dresser, and clothes hanging in the closet that weren't messed up. Yes, and your book is is riddled with these kinds of surreal photographs. I mean, there, uh, there are photographs of cars in which the back half of the car looks fine. Um, a, a police car, for example, half of the lights are undamaged. The rest of the car is completely toasted. Right, even to the point of eating out the, the, the metal. You know they don't drive old junkers around. Right, right. The metal, yeah, the metal is eaten out, and yet the other half of the car is inta- totally intact. Like it just came off the showroom floor. Exactly. I mean, it, it doesn't even have scratches on the paint, it looks like. And, and, I mean, and plas- yeah, plastic police lights on the top on one side look untouched, and they would melt pretty easily. Yes, and, and again, I mean, what what can cause something like that? What it, I'm not suggesting that you tell us, I mean, what did happen, but I'm saying what can cause that kind of thing? When I see an abrupt change, uh, well, especially at the, between the driver's, I mean, the front seat door and the back seat door, I start thinking about a rubber gasket between the two. Mm-hmm. That maybe it had some electrical or something something that uh, that sealed from the the phenomenon continuing further, but the other side of it where it has that circular spot that's unaffected. That was a big aha moment for me. With the background in interferometry, I know that you can have one beam or another, but where they interfere, you get a different effect. So explain that to us a little more regarding these cars. Well, it's kind of like, you know, contact print with with a photographic film. You see an abrupt area, not shades of gray. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a something that caused uh, the toasting, and then one nanometer over, it was in pristine condition. Fires don't do that. So are you saying there was a type of interference that would occur to change that? That would easily explain that some type of interference, where because uh, you, otherwise you you would have a tapering off effect. Right, right, that makes sense. You see cars that are that are burned from, and I'm not going to say toast them, say burn. You know, from a car fire that we know is a car fire, you'll see at the edge of where it stops burning, you know, ch- you know toasted area and it's charred and then, you know, less and less and then it's pristine. It's a, there's a transition zone. Yes. But to have something abrupt, it's like photographic masking yes. in a way. 
Yes, it's again. I mean, there's a surreal quality to that photograph, but also many, many other photographs. Another one that、uh, was to me, I, I just kept staring at it. Was、um, I think it's figure figure one o four in your book, where you have these、uh, steel core columns, which. I guess you. I guess you'd. I mean, it looks like they're vaporizing, but that's not the right word. As you say, it's dustifying. They're、yep. just. They're just. They're there and they're solid, and then they start becoming almost like apparitions, and then they're gone, in the same shape. I would like to point out something here that my detractors often say. Well, it fell down. So what if it fell down? You still need to explain what happened here, because in the first image, you know, the building is coming apart right next to it. And, Going down or going wherever it's going, and it, it peels away like peeling a banana, and you're left with these core columns standing up. Yes, and they are crisp. You have blue sky in the background, and they have crisp edges. And then you see them getting fuzzy, and then you see just you know fuzz there. Fuzz and, in the same, but in the same shape, in the same place, the fuzz. Right. And my detractors say, well, that it shook off dust that was sitting on, resting on it, that had settled on it before it dropped, because it's so fine it hung in the air. If dust is that so fine that it hung in the air, how you would, come you didn't see it in the first frame? Yeah, I was going to say you wouldn't. Yeah, exactly. That that. How did it settle instantly, and then hang in the air later? So it, it, this is this argument stands regardless of if you say it fell over. I can't imagine how a seven hundred foot tall column could drop into a hole in the ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There does there was no evidence for that. And it didn't tip over because it would take out a few blocks worth of buildings. Right. So there's no evidence for it falling down. Right. And going into the whole theory that of the controlled demolition, I mean, we we haven't really、uh, talked about any of the science, but you have very specific,、um, many pages in the book devoted to why the, even the idea of a nano thermite technology. Could not have been the source of of bringing down of the buildings. Could you go ahead and explain in only minimally scientific terms what that's about? Okay,、uh, in a way, it's it's that、uh, you know. Well, you know, I, I say by thermite, do you mean、uh, powdered、uh, aluminum and powdered iron rust? That's what thermite is, is typically. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have no doubt that that was there in the dust. Because you know that's my point. The buildings turned to dust, and the buildings were made out of steel structures with aluminum cladding. So if that turned to dust, and nano-sized particles, that's what you'd have in the dust. And not only that, you saw this.、Uh, you were seeing evidence of very rapid resting of certain of the pieces that that would go way beyond any kind of resting process that would normally happen, as though it was resting on speed. Right. If if you've ever left a, an iron skillet in the sink soaking,、mm-hmm. and you scrubbed it so it's real clean in one one area, that area pretty soon turns bright orange、mm-hmm. from the rust because、yeah. it's pure iron. Pure iron will rust. Steel、uh, structures、uh, have that that type of steel has other components,、uh, carbon and other you know add-ins that enhance its structural properties and enhance its.、Uh, Uh, ability to resist environmental degradation,、mm-hmm. like from rust. So if this rusts quickly, that means its properties have changed, and it, it if it lets go of these other doodads, like you know the iron molecules separate from the carbon,、mm-hmm. like you know the, the surface is partly dissolved.、Mm-hmm. That would explain instant rusting. Yes, that would explain it. But what would it take for that to happen? For these molecules to part? Molecular dissociation. Yes. What would? How could that happen? Well, usually molecules are attracted to each other and locked onto each other. And let's say somehow you could turn a switch and cause them to do the reverse to repel each other.、Mm-hmm. That is what it looked like was happening when this building kind of billowed out into dust. What could cause that?、Uh, certain types of energy fields interfering. Okay. Well, we're, we're going to get to that in a second. Then, in a little more detail, I wanted to、um, continue on this whole、uh, area with the steel beams and and the supposed debris、uh, and rusting. But the the steel, I think we all remember where they said, well, all this、uh, excess steel, you know, the steel scrap is was shipped to China. Now. 
What you're saying here is that by September 13th in the morning, so that would have to mean on the 12th. What? Actually, some of those pictures were taken on the 11th, but they okay. weren't logged in until the 12th. So just to be extra safe, I used the uh, caption date. But um, if, if you look at the camera info data, it's the 11th. Okay, so here we are. People are literally just trying to get the dust off their clothing and shake their head and figure out what just happened to me, what just happened to this city, what happened to everybody else. And at this same time, the steel had already been scooped up and shipped off to China? <laughs> exactly. Pretty good cover story, isn't it? Well, it's stupid. <laughs> I mean, that's just stupid. <laughs> Towards the beginning, to get a, a, a light-hard moment, I'd say, oh, where's this, where is that steel? Oh, it's hiding across the street under that hubcap. <laughs> well, and the point is, where was the steel? I mean, how much steel are we talking about here, A, that was shipped off to China, right? How much? I mean, what did they say they had managed to accumulate and ship to China? I, I'm guessing there's, there's two beams, because then they could say beams, plural. <laughs> and, and not be lying. <laughs> so the point is, there wasn't a lot of steel to ship off to China, but what a story. Oh, we had our people on it. We were prepared. We had these massive steel beams, lots of them piled up, shipped them off to China within 24 hours of the building going down. I mean, when I say stupid, I mean, it, it's absolutely it, absurd. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. Exactly. And those uh, columns that, that dustified mm -hmm. before our, our very eyes? Yes. The base of those, I believe, is stairwell B, and there were 14 people who survived in stairwell B. The rest of the building dustified around them, and they were left in stairwell oh, B. Interesting. And, and when they came out, as this one, uh, one of the firefighters said, I, I looked and said, guys, there used to be 106 floors above us, and now I'm seeing sunshine. There's nothing above us. That big building doesn't exist. Right. And he later said, these are the biggest office buildings in the world, and I didn't see one desk, one chair. One phone, nothing. Yeah. And yet there was another photo there of something that was that was showing up in the debris later. I can't remember what building it came from now. And it, it was just the oddest photograph because it was of a ball of compressed metal from the Ben and Jerry's store. Oh, right. That it had little like a football. Yeah, like a football that had intact pieces of $20 bills, corners of $20 bills sticking out of this compressed metal. This makes no sense. And, and colored dividers. And colored dividers. I mean... It was, it was the only file cabinet found. I mean, how did, they, well, how did they even know it was a file cabinet? It looked like a football of metal. That's true. And, and they were able to identify what store it was from, and they called up the store owner and said, hey, we got your money. And they gave him their money, his money, the Ben and Jerry store owner. You mean the money that was twisted up inside that football? Or was yeah. there some? Uh, yeah. that, that was weird. I mean, how, how can that happen that you have this densely compacted metal with totally intact pieces of paper sticking out? It didn't burn. It didn't burn. And again, the same thing happens over and over. Papers seem to be intact. There are papers floating all over. In fact, papers came down before the dust came down. Um, and this whole subject of paper near cars that had just been not incinerated, uh, toasted. <laughs> toasted. These cars that had been toasted all around are these flutters of paper that had landed around these cars, and yet they were totally intact. And there's there's uh, some images where y you have this orange glowing piece of material. We don't know what it is, but something orange and glowing, sitting on paper, and the paper's not burning. Yeah, that yeah. Okay, so I mean, we're just we're just now adding more evidence to the weirdness of this whole thing. I'm not asking you to step out on a limb beyond what you've already done, which is huge. Um, but what I, what I say about that is, you know, we do know that hot things glow. Yes. But also, not everything that glows is hot. Yes. We can compare a fluorescent light bulb with an incandescent light bulb. Mm -hmm. There's two different phenomena going on there. Mm -hmm. Also, there's fireflies that glow. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. And so there was this, uh, this phenomena that was occurring. And again, I mean, you have all these, these people that went through this experience. I mean... Uh, we can just, we, and we will, I have more things I want to ask you about here, but it's just one surreal, 
odd bit of evidence after another. None of it stacks up to anything that's been spoken of up until this time. And you had people, uh, Tim McGinn, um, you, you mentioned, he, he said uh, <laughs> to the people that he came in, he was one of the witnesses, said, basically, where are the F for the towers? What happened? Where's the debris? <laughs> he was, everyone was just standing there as though they were in a daze. What just happened? Where, where's the sound? Where's the collapse? Um, Where are the this towers? Is, this is when they were, they were trapped. In, still, those 14 people were trapped in the, in the stairwell. They were on their, their handy talkies calling for their buddies to come rescue them. Yeah, where are you? Uh, stairwell B, Tower 1. Where? Tower 1, Stairwell B. What? <laughs> yeah. Where's Tower 1? <laughs> they I thought mean, these voices were coming out of nowhere. <laughs> well, this I mean, there's nothing funny about it. But it, again, everything about this is so, absur- so absurd and extreme. And one of the things um, that you show in this book is when you have a traditional kind of explosion, such as a controlled demolition, you have a certain kind of window breakage um, and so forth. The signatures of the glass that was broken wasn't anything like a normal demolition, though, was it? Oh, more than that, very much uh, different. Uh, you think about this, just mental exercise. Uh, whether it's pancaking down on its own or you have uh, cutter charges chopping things up and the junk's coming down, whatever the case is, if that stuff lands on the ground, squirt stuff out the side, at that time, you know, if it's taken eight seconds to come down or 10 seconds to come down, uh, that by the time it gets to the ground, that stuff is squirting out of there at, you know, Mach 1 to Mach 2. Mm-hmm. And if that stuff is shooting out, we're talking about, you know, a soda pop can, everything, it becomes a projectile mm-hmm. and, and pieces of junk, and it would be, uh, all the shrapnel would be all hitting every building around the complex. Right. And you'd have pock marks all over. Yet the the facade of these buildings is nearly pristine. It doesn't have all this. It doesn't look like it was sandblasted with, or you know, had a rocket launcher shooting all sorts of trash at it. Mm-hmm. Except we have rounded holes in windows. The yes. outer pane, well, the inner pane is still intact. Yeah, that that was bizarre. How do you get a professional glass glass cutter to even do that? Well, I don't think you could. How would a an energy device even do that? As it turns out, uh, longitudinal energy waves do this. And I hypothesized, that, you know, with this, how the mechanics would be. Imagine if you um, dropped a rock at a pond, still pond. You see the ripples go outward mm-hmm. because you've displaced the water laterally. Mm-hmm. It, it seems to be, and it would be either round wakes. So if you if you uh, shoot an energy weave beam at a, a window, you might get the same kind of thing rippling outward, like a rock going through water. Mm-hmm. When a physical object like a rock hits a window, it bends it, and it you know kind of bows out, you know very instantaneously. And glass, uh, because it's a brittle material, can't handle being put in tension, and when it bows out from the rock hitting it, the opposite side is in tension, and it breaks. Mm-hmm. So what this says is, you know, you know, breaks the whole window. You get cracks all over the place, mm-hmm. spider web like pattern. Anyone who's thrown a baseball through a window mm-hmm. you know, is seen that, you know, the window gets trashed. You don't make a round hole in the middle of the window. Mm-hmm. So this is something else doing that. And as it turns out, uh, that that can be replicated in the lab with longitudinal energy waves. Okay, and we're going to go to that again in just a little bit once we get through all the right. evidence right. here. Um, there was another odd little bit here about some uh, molten steel in steel-toed boots, but apparently the flesh of the person didn't burn. Did I understand that correctly? Steel-toed boots is one of the biggest things. Um, steel-toed boots? Steel-toed boots. Out still on the rubble, it's still, uh, I believe, 1,100 degrees. The guy's boots just melt within a few hours. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of stories like this that get repeated over and over again because in that moment, people have questions. They need answers. They don't, they, as soon as they're given answers, they go on. They don't stop to think if that's a reasonable answer in this moment of, you know, dramatic events 
and they just repeat them over and over again, and people keep repeating them. And even the the, the truth movement it kept repeating the story about steel-toed boots were melting uh, because it was so hot. Well, if you if you put something on your grill that hot that's going to melt your you know melt steel. Uh, you're not going to be surviving through that. And as I like to say, if, if, I, uh, if my steel oven is melting, the turkey inside is more than well done. Yes. But and we have no reports of burned feet. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, what I was reading. What, so go ahead. So, it, what it, But what it captures is something is reminding someone of this. They're describing what's happening the best they can. Well, I have a little note here in the sidelines that it's what? 11, it takes a, that the heat was... The heat would normally be what at 1,100 degrees or so to create the molten steel. Did I write that down correctly? Uh, maybe uh, it's like 1,500 centigrade or, or 2,800 Fahrenheit. Oh, okay. All right. Way out there. It, Way. You're definitely going to have your, your turkey overcooked with that. Well, you're going to have your tootsies burned. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. there's no uh, there's no reports of burned feet or, or you know burned uh, bones or toes. But the boots apparently were disintegrating. There's also a, a story about uh, the last guy out. They, they knew he just got out by the skin of his teeth because his shoes were blown clear off. His feet, that's what his friend oh, said. Wow. So here we have, I mean, just now kind of going back at some of the things we've talked about, some of these oddities. We have uh, steel melting at, that would normally melt at very high temperatures uh, without burning people's feet. So we have windows where a hole has been uh, blown out of one pane but not the other pane. Um, we have cars that have been toasted, and then half the other half of the car can be absolutely pristine. People who are 1,200 of them, who totally against anything in human nature, are jumping or falling on the outside of this building at 105 floors and below, jumping or falling to their deaths, but they seem to be almost, almost microwaved from the inside because they're coming down in body parts. That's not that's not normal for free fall. Um, big steel beams that ha appear in these pictures, I mean, it looks to me like they're dustifying. We just talked about that. They didn't fall over. Um, cars that are blowing up seven blocks, or, or toasting seven blocks away, vehicles blowing up. Uh, all these things going on that don't make any sense whatsoever for any kind of normal demolition that we're talking about. Now, I, I want to ask you about this because you've gotten a lot of, um, you've drawn a lot of heat from the 9-11 uh, truth movement that who have uh, bought into the story this was a controlled demolition. My question is, why aren't they more, why do you think they might not be more open to this evidence here? It seems like everybody's looking for the truth on this. Why is there any resistance among these professionals to look at your work seriously? Or are they starting to do that now? 9-11 uh, uh, was a psychological operation, including uh, the thermite story, the bombs in the building story that were planted there. Like, uh, you know, when NIST had their... Uh, press conference about talking about the release of the Building 7 report, they had this neat and tidy false choice. And I, in my uh, comments to them, I called them on that and notified them of of uh, fraud, that they were guilty of fraud because they uh, uh, denied the uh, bombs in the building story by saying it was silent, you know, it, was no, it wasn't a loud noise associated with it, so it couldn't be bombs in the building. But they didn't apply that to their own story. Mm -hmm. if, if the building came crashing down. It should sound like it was raining dump trucks. Yes. And it, did, and it was silent. So that also dismisses their story. You know, they contradicted their own story. Well, so, so you're they, saying that, was, that story about the thermite and the, um, the controlled demolition was also planted to manage impressions? Very much, very much. Even on that day, we had Dan Rather saying it looks like a controlled demolition. Uh, there's the uh, Van Romero that afternoon uh, said it was, he was sure it was a controlled demolition. It only take a few explosives to do it. Then a week later, he retracted it, and then right after that, he got $85 million in grant money. Ah, so it must be true. Turns out a year before 9-11, he uh, did a short course, gave a short course 
uh, on energy weapons at the Directed Energy Professional Society's annual meeting. So he knew what he was looking at. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a mistake of what he was looking at. Mm -hmm. there's, there's all these Easter eggs, I call them, that were left out like, like an Easter egg hunt for a three-year-old. They, they, when the three-year-old finds them, they, they think they've really found something important, and they hang on to it, like Larry Silverstein's pullet. Yes, I was just going to ask you that exact question. Please tell tell us more about well, that because a lot of people saw that in the film Loose Change. I saw it, and it's Larry Silverstein saying, "Oh yeah, we had to pull it." It's it's sort of silly because what are what are they saying that uh, firefighters go around with sticks of dynamite in their back pocket just in case? You know, that's how they fight fires with sticks of dynamite in their pockets. But wh why would Larry Silverstein say that? I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. And then we watched the building collapse. Uh, who knows if it was something that was taken out of context or, or if it was if he was putting out the Easter egg or what it was. But it makes no sense. No. Because fire departments are not in the, the business of controlled demolition. Plus, if you don't know what the story is, you can't size up the event. You, can't, you don't know where the damage is in the building. You know, if you're going to chuck in that piece of dynamite, you launch it in there, where do you put it? Oh, well, not only that. I mean, if it were a traditional controlled demolition, wouldn't it have taken weeks or even months to prepare? Oh, yeah. It, there's there's so much about it that right. uh, it just it doesn't make sense. Plus, if you had controlled demolition, it breaks buildings into chunks, and the chunks slam to the ground. With Building 7, that's, that is indeed the smoking gun. There was essentially no seismic signature of that building's demise. You know, just a teeny bit, like a, a 0 0.6 on the Richter scale. There were, that day there were um, quarry blasts over New Jersey in Pennsylvania. Those were picked up. Mm -hmm. But the demise of Building 7 didn't make a, a seismic impact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> out of back, it really stood out from background noise. And it's six times the uh, potential energy of the Seattle Kingdom. Yes. Yeah, and you do a good job of uh, detailing that in the book. The I've, Seattle Cape Town by the 2.3. Yeah, 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 it doesn't make, again, I mean, none of this makes any sense. What, what, what I'm wondering here is if you're saying that this is part of the um, mind control or disinformation that, like you say, Dan Rather said, it almost looks like a controlled def demolition. If this was starting so early on, what I don't get is how would that support the larger, supposed larger agenda of creating this um, fear of the Islamic world and everything that we've gotten into in the name of 9-11. Uh, oh, look, look at how people argue about opinions about thermite or, or nukes or this or that. And it just, you get this big, huge muddle up and everyone's around in circles, uh, you know, arguing it with people. It, it's really destroyed people's... Um, ability to reason. I mean, as you've seen in this book, it's right in front of us. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. But why don't why don't people see it? Because it was such a strong psychological operation. It, it destroyed people's ability to, to know what's real and what's not. So, and and they, they, they want to know what the truth is, and they, they run to these, this truth movement business. But as I point out, do, do you think those who pulled off 9-11 just forgot to plan a cover-up? No, no. And so what would it look like? <laughs> yeah, very true. Well, now let's get into sort of the meat of what you're talking about here. Um, all of these anomalies, and every single thing we've talked about is an anomaly, if you're looking at the official story or the controlled demolition story. Everything is anomalous. It would make no sense. But it does make sense when you're talking about directed energy weapons. And you go into uh, Tesla's technology a fair amount in here. Can you begin... Uh, just, again, without being s so scientific that you're going to, to lose the non-scientists <laughs> among us, yeah. can you begin <laughs> talking, yeah, can you begin uh, on a layperson's level talking about the Tesla technology and what exactly could have caused this weird kind of damage across well, the board? Well, well, first of all, you know, not knowing what this, this you know, weapon was, mm -hmm. it's not a kinetic energy weapon, like a bomb or bullet or something that throws something from, you know, and hits something. 
Uh, like if you you throw a, r a br brick at someone and hit them, that's a kinetic energy weapon. Uh, a directed energy weapon is, is energy that's been directed and was used as a weapon. A very general, general category. I don't know how else to categorize it. And sure, there are, you know, lasers and other things like that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about energy field and field effects that happen in a field. And it's, it's obviously the energy was directed because it was pretty precise as to how it acted that day. And it wasn't a random orientation of, of energy. And also, you know, kinetic energy weapons involve heat and expansion of heat. Um, you know, and sound waves, things go boom, and that didn't happen. But it was something that, you know, right before your eyes, you saw those steel columns dustify. You didn't see anything hit it. Mm -mm. And that's a signature there, too, uh, is it, of energy um, weapons affecting it. But when I was looking at the data, and I believe in you look at the data long enough, it'll tell you what happened. If you don't know what happened, just keep looking. And I kept tabulating all the different characteristics, and I'd give them whatever names came to mind as unique descriptions, like fuzzballs. We didn't talk much about that. Um, you know, the, the columns, as they're falling, mm -hmm. turn to dust. That dust lands, and you have clear blue sky behind it. And then that dust starts breaking down and rising up. So we know the dust continued breaking down. I, and it, at first it was kicked up around people's feet, and I called those fuzzballs. And then after a while, you notice it's rising on its own. And uh, as, in an, as in anti-gravitational? Uh, as in being so fine that it, that it just floats up. I see. Yeah, no mass. Very little mass, yeah. Uh, just, and also the dust rollout, you know, mm -hmm. the, when the dust rollout first occurred, it comes to an abrupt stop at a particular street. You know, when the South Tower first went... It rolled out to the north, up to one street, and then when the north tower went, it rolled up one block further. The towers are one block apart from each other. Well, that's that, bizarre. So there, there was a somehow a controlled extension of this, or was it that the natural to the dynamic of what ever destroyed it? The latter. I think it is natural to the dynamic of what destroyed it. If it's breaking down at a certain rate, uh -huh. you know, you can get a rock and throw it pretty far, but how far can you throw throw flour? Yeah. And so if this is breaking down at a certain rate, it gets down to a certain size, that it just it quits going further, and, it, and that it just floats, floats with the wind. And there was this amazing video from uh, Bob and Bree's apartment they, they took, and you could see the dust almost came to their window. It didn't quite touch their window, and then started rising up like yeast bread. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. That was amazing. So there's all these different phenomena that I, I was tabulating, including uh, the peeling effect on cars, like the split thickness of the door would peel, which is, you know, these are not laminated doors, so why does it look like it's delaminating? Mm -hmm. And there's just, you just keep adding these things up. I didn't know what it meant, and I didn't force it into any particular conclusion. You know, it's, if somebody takes a multiple choice test, they're forcing things into particular slots of what they know of. Instead, I was letting the data speak. And then one day I happened upon a blog of someone, and my goodness, these look like they came from the World Trade Center. But wait, this, this guy did it in his own, you know, his own uh, apartment. He had reproduced all of the same phenomena that I had noticed including that split thickness. He had a piece of aluminum that split open, uh, including things dustifying, loading up. The, the fumes um, that rose up, I, I don't call it dust because you don't know exactly what it is. Uh, not fuzzballs, but fuzzy blobs. It's something else. It's this haze that kind of drifts around. And he actually had a name for it. <laughs> he named it after somebody. He called it Carl. Uh, uh, uh. It, so it was all of the same... Phenomena. It was. It was just totally amazing. And he created this as a result of experimentation in his living room, in in his uh, apartment. Um, yeah, in his apartment. Well, right. Okay. So a little while ago, when we were talking about the windows, you, one of the things you said could have been involved. Is, I mean, could could be responsible for such a reaction was long, longitudinal energy waves, which you said can be created in a lab setting. 
Yes, and he, is, he had experienced that too, round holes in, in windows. Was he working with longitudinal energy waves? Yes. And uh, he, had, he had created, he um, was trying to replicate the work of Nikola Tesla. And he first started out with a big uh, Tesla coil and then would interfere in that, uh, in that static field, uh, various radio frequency signals. And then started getting weird effects. I thought, oh, this is fun. Let's, you know, see what happens here. You get something that rises up. Sometimes something would fly up. Sometimes it would, it would tear apart. And there's, I've got videos of some of these um, experiments on my website where, you know, the, the, uh, you have a metal file where it cracks in half and then the one half it slides over relative to the other half. Mm-hmm. And, and then there's a piece of uh, steel rod that, that starts doing sit-ups. <laughs> It's a rigid seal rod. It's like it turns into to jello, and or jelly just starts doing sit ups and then snakes around. There's another one that's uh, about two inches in diameter that looks almost like it has a heartbeat. You see the shimmer on the surface of it, it it's just very liquidy. And then after turning off the gizmo, you know, the signals and so forth, it, it re solidifies. Um, and sometimes uh, it, it, it goes into spontaneous combustion. Doesn't that sound uh, familiar? Yes, it does. Um, you talked about John Hutchinson in here. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's, that's who I was talking about yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After I uh, found that blog, that was his blog, yeah. uh, I got in touch with him and went to visit him and you know, saw his, his stuff, mm-hmm. his uh, you know, various samples and, and the, the equipment in action and whatnot. And it was just it's really amazing. Well, now, so, I mean, obviously, John is brilliant. Uh, we know we, anyone who's followed him through the years, this is, this is a brilliant human being. So we know that he understands these principles, and he can uh, apparently, you know, recreate this phenomena with experiments with energy, energy-directed devices and so forth. But Would never uh, use it as a weapon. Would never use it as a weapon. With knowledge, how, let's just say, some other parties have that knowledge and choose to use that as a weapon. How difficult is it to use uh, as a weapon? I mean, is it does it take some extraordinary kind of uh, materials or something to do this, or is it once you understand the principles, is it a relatively simple thing to do? It, I think it's relatively simple, but you need to have control of the various components of it. Uh, John doesn't write anything down. He, it's, it's, um, he's just enjoying playing with nature, seeing what nature can do, mm-hmm. and experimenting. Not, not to reproduce it for you know money or patents or yes. you know, controlling others. It's just like, hey, this is fun. Let's mm-hmm. see what this could do, and and move something around. Like, you can imagine how fun it is to to watch a piece of steel do sit ups. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. he's been at it for decades. <laughs> <laughs> and and. Uh, you know, actually, the um, U.S. Uh, I guess Pentagon folks from the Pentagon went to visit his place in 1983 oh, for four su- months. Not surprising for four months. <laughs> I, think they, I think they wanted to see what he was up to. <laughs> well, we can assume that folks in the military and the Pentagon have access to this technology. I, I think that's oh, certainly yeah. they certainly yeah. have to. That that's a given. Um, but now we, we have people that like in the turn of the century. Uh, yeah, you know George Pigott, who has even a patent on it. Uh, you know, it shows a picture of a little drawing of his little po tie, you know, observing those levitating steel balls. And, uh, you know, this Ed Leedskalnen, who built Coral Castle. Yes. And it seems he's got the same technologies. It, it, he only had a fourth grade education, came over from Latvia, got this wheel that spins around with magnets on it, and cranks it up. It's an it's, uh, electrical generator and also would move these, you know, 15-ton stones around. Yes. Stones approximately the size of the ones used to build uh, the Great Pyramid. Well, I mean, as as a, um, a kind of a political agenda, we're really, you know, very quick and happy to hang responsibility on certain people, certain groups, certain individuals. But uh, in reality, is it fair to say that any number of parties could have access to this kind of uh, directed energy? Now we have to call it a weapon because it was used in a violent manner as a weapon. Is this something that um, any of the parties that have been um, accused or uh, 
who have been, you know, thought to be possibly responsible could have this technology? Well, I, I try to stay away from the, uh, you know, blaming before you know what happened. So I was not listening to what others were pointing fingers at. Right. But one thing is clear that, you know, anyone could be could do this. And, uh, you know, revenge doesn't keep it from happening again. Revenge, you know, you hear the phrase, an eye for an eye it leaves the whole world blind. I think that's very true. Revenge is not going to keep this from happening again. No, absolutely knowing not. Knowing about it, knowing, if everyone knows about it, that's better. <laughs> How could that keep it from happening again? If people know about this technology, they can use it for good. I think that's why Nikola Tesla did not want to release this, uh, because it it could provide free energy to the world, but he was afraid it would be used for evil purposes. Well, already been there, done that. Don't have that risk anymore. Let's use it for good. Another uh, aspect of this is it's free energy technology. Yes. Right now, if somebody develops free energy technology in their basement all by themselves, they usually end up getting suicided or, you know, yes. car wreck, something happens to them. Right. One by one, people can't develop it. But if everyone knows about this, everyone witnessed what happened that day. You look at the cover of my book, and there's no denying what right. happened. Right. That free energy technology does exist. If that is known wide enough, everyone can develop it out in the open. Is that really part of um, your impetus for having gone to this much trouble to write this book? I mean, other than the fact you wanted answers. You, from the first minute, you knew something was wrong when you saw this on the news on September 11th. Also, whatever did this can be used for good. Yes. That's, that was the motivating thing behind it is, you know, and if we stick our head in the sands, it, that, that's giving permission for whoever did the bad thing about it, you know, to use it again. Another aspect that came to mind along the way was uh, it's also quite patriotic to be doing what I'm doing. Absolutely. I'm defending our country. Um, If you, you know, entertain this scenario, if you were one of four or five people who wanted to take over the United States, you don't just go in the front door because the U.S. military would come get you. When you do, you you have access to a gizmo like this. You turn the towers into dust, and then uh, you start a truth movement. Just you know, play along with the scenario, and you turn these, these well-meaning individuals, you turn them against their own government, have them destroy their country from within, have them hate their government so badly that when you, you know, they want any government but the one they have. So you walk in, and they welcome you with open arms. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that looks like what's going on. Yeah, we don't know if it's you know what entity where, and it, it you know sure we know who covered it up, and if you want to know whose technology it is, go ask them. And that's what I tried to do with my federal ketam case, uh, but they uh, they put a stop to it. But the judges uh, respected me enough that they put in the footnote that they were ignoring the law to dismiss my case. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was respectful. And I, I respect them for that, too. That's integrity. It's like everyone is, is uh, you know, got a gun to their head or is blackmailed you know, or held hostage. It would seem, yes, it does seem that way. And to get any kind of clarity on it seems virtually impossible. From, from uh, some entity like that that is being controlled. Yes, yes. And I somehow, you know, managed to survive getting my book out. Now I'm pretty safe because... You know, doing me and would you give more attention to the book? Are, so, are um, do you have a lot of interested parties with this book? I mean, people that are maybe positioned in places that could benefit from knowing this. I mean, everyone can benefit from knowing it, but you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah, I've had various people contacting me, and they're not in the truth movement or anywhere like that. It's people outside the truth movement that respect me. Mm-hmm. Uh, greatly. And it's like they didn't want to stick their neck out and they're glad that somebody did. Yeah. And I, I also felt I was in the best position not having family. Yes. You know, if you have a family, your decisions are different. Absolutely. And so I felt there was more responsibility on me to, to do this. Well, that that's very clear thinking. And also it's very courageous thinking. And uh, we, we don't, 
we probably, I need to just tell people you've got to get a copy of this book. If you want to see all this for yourself, there are, I mean, it looks like almost thousands of images. How I don't know how many images are in here. I didn't count, but a lot. Um, and graphs, uh, charts of every kind. It's, it's like you say, it's staring you right in the face. Anyone that reads this can never see the event of that morning in the same way again, which does bring up the bigger issues. And I hear a kind of almost like girlish excitement in your voice on one level that you blasted through this, you got it out there, and you are an optimist. This isn't about taking anyone down. This is about saying, let's just show the world the horrors of what it can do will show the world the good that it can do. And that's what I really hear in your voice, as you said earlier. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, that is the intention. That it, revenge doesn't doesn't help anyone, except the, those who are trying to control us. Yeah. Well, on that note, um, we won't go into Hurricane Aaron and, and any of the other phenomena around. We've gone through so much already. I'm sure people's heads are spinning. Um, I want to thank you so much for your time and for having taken the time and the energy to have written this uh, amazing book, Where Did the Towers Go? So on that note, Judy, thank you so much. I wish you the very best in getting the word out there. And also, I wish us I wish us all um, the good fortune that this energy source will be revealed for the good of all. Keep in mind, truth is unifying. Yes, it is. It is indeed. Judy, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I cannot encourage you strongly enough to get a copy of this book. We all need a reality check on this paradigm-changing event that has affected our lives on countless levels. You can go to our website at wheredidthetowersgo.com to buy a copy. You can also learn more about Dr. Judy's work at her website, drjudywood.com. Until next time, thanks for listening.